So, um, as we discussed, there's no, there not going to be a problem session tomorrow. I'll have special office hours on Monday over lunch hour for those who want to uh, discuss anything about homework or whatever. Um, and uh, there's our IYL, International Year of Light, event tomorrow, which you are all encouraged to go to. And of course, we also have a very special physics colloquium tomorrow by Gordon Lauber. I think you can uh, safely be called the father of quantum optics, and he has uh, the title of his colloquium is what is quantum optics? So we'll find out, because maybe it's been all wrong here for half a semester. Uh, that uh, starts at um, um, 4 o'clock. It's in Dane Smith Hall. Uh, um, so if you just go to Dane Smith Hall, you'll see it's, there's uh, donuts at a quarter till. And uh, <laughs> bagels. Uh, get there early. Um, We'll be talking about the, uh, the Glauber theory of coherence and uh, the history of that uh, uh, right after fall break. It, it's really, for me, it, I mean, it really is very close to my heart because I can safely say that, that uh, the reason I'm doing what I'm doing is because of Roy Glauber. Uh, I went to, started my graduate career thinking I was going to do plasma physics, a lot of crazy things. Uh, and um, I was always interested in quantum mechanics, but I didn't know that many they called quantum optics, and it didn't exist as a kind of discipline in many places back in, in the Stone Age. Um, and um, I had, in my first year of graduate school, I had to do a term paper for EM class, actually. And I, I chose as my topic the classical limit of QED, because you know, I learned about this thing called the photon, and this thing of Maxwell equations. And they seem to have nothing to do with one another, right? I mean, there's this ball, and it makes it jump, and then you have this thing with the wave. What the heck are we talking about? And so I did a little research and found this, this um, set of uh, lectures that were given in uh, the 1960s. I think it was 1966 at the summer school. In, in the Alps of France in a school called Les Ouches, which I'm actually going to be giving them because I don't even go the summer school this year uh, myself. Um, and it was like the party gates opened, and I saw it, and, and I saw the truth, and it was the most beautifully written. You know, there are some people who are just very important, and something I just take to heart. If you want to be a good scientist, also be a good writer. Because you can't communicate your ideas for posterity, you're not really making a contribution. And I'm not a good writer, I work hard at it, but I can see good writing when I see when I read it. And there are some people who just write with such incredible clarity, and he's one of them. You should, we'll, we'll, I'll give you those notes for you because you should read them, they're fabulous. Another person who's like that is our own Carl Caves. If you ever read his writing there, she's like, Right back. <laughs> so, anyway. Um, Zeke, you had a question? I was just wondering, do you think that this colloquium will be like extra packed? Yeah, I do. So you kind of get there early to get good seats? Or? Uh, uh, yeah, I do. Okay. I mean, he is a Nobel laureate. Okay. Um, Roy is now 91. Uh, this is an opportunity to see him. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Maybe he's a great guy. All right. Um, yeah, my very first conference as a graduate student I went to was here in New Mexico, in Santa Fe. And who was there but Roy Glauber? So, um, all right. Enough of fun. Uh, let's get to physics. Um, all right. So, um, you last lecture we talked about the important problem, so just looking at the response of a two-level atom when it's being driven by a monochromatic field near resonance in the presence of spontaneous emission or whatever decays the excited state. 
Um, and uh, the equations of motion we wrote in terms of the master equation, as to say the equations for the uh, elements of the density matrix. Um, and they are written here. Uh, the four elements of the two by two density matrix. Um, and uh, what we see is that the Proctor's in the excited state is driven uh, via the Rabi frequency, um, and it depends on the imaginary component of, of uh, the octagon element, the, co uh, op the coherence here, the V component of the block vector. Um, and the octagonal elements tell us about the coherence between the excited and ground state, and it is that coherence that tells us the magnitude of the induced electric dipole moment. Okay? And so the dipole moment that uh, is being induced uh, depends on this octagonal element. And written in terms of its real imaginary parts, it depends on the real part of this coherence, that is the part that tells us how much I'm in phase with the driving, assuming taking that phase to be zero. And there's a part that's in quadrature, and as we discussed, that's related to absorption and emission uh, of the light. Okay? Uh, so we solved this equation in steady state, <coughs> and we get this solution for the coherences in steady state. How much coherence do we get between them? And uh, in, in the case where the excitation is weak, and as we discussed, that's the case where the saturation parameter is small, then this takes the familiar form of a complex Lorentzian. The same thing that we saw at the beginning of the semester for a simple, a damp, simple harmonic oscillator. That is linear response, okay? And so in this limit, the induced dipole moment just looks like a polarizable particle that's linearly polarizable with the pol amount of dipole moment proportional to the field. And the amount of dipole that we get is depends on the polarizability, right? So that polarizability is as a real part, an imaginary part related to the dispersive uh, and absorptive slash emissive part. Okay. So in the limit of weak excitation, we should just think about the two-level atom like Lorentz oscillator exactly like a Lorentz oscillator, a charge on a spring that is responding linearly to the force applied to it, all right? Um, that's very different from Rabi oscillations, all right? I mean, Rabi oscillation is about as non-classical as you can get. I mean, if we think about this on the block sphere, the classical kind of dipole oscillation corresponds to what? What is the block vector doing if I just have an oscillating dipole? Yeah, just sliding up and down. No. Well, there's no coherences? Or? No, let's think about that. If I have a dipole moment, I have coherence, okay. right? But now just say I have, let's say I'm in steady state. Okay, I'm in steady state and the amount of coherence I have is this, okay? And now the dipole is changing, the dipole moment is changing the function of time. Here's how it's changing, or I write it this way. What's the block vector doing in the, in the lab frame, not in the rotating frame? In the rotating frame, it's not moving, right? Because it's in steady state. It's on the way I'm going like that. It's rotating around the z-axis. Right? So, you know, I have some amount of coherence here and some amount of population. Uh, 
excited versus ground in steady state. And in the lab frame, the block vector is rotating around the z-axis. Okay? That's classical dipole oscillation. As opposed to when I'm driving the system and it's not in steady state, it's doing Robbie oscillations. Well, of course, in the rotating frame, it's not my resonance, it's doing that in the, you know, in the rotating, in the lab frame, I'm sorry, the rotating frame, it, oh, it goes this, it's doing this kind of thing, up and down, right? And this going from, you know, the S orbital, say, to the P orbital, that, and just having, going from here to here in some superposition, that's not, that's very non-classical. The classical thing is that I have some fixed superposition and the charge just goes back and forth. Okay. All right. Um, so, um, the other thing we were looking at last time is the, uh, how the populations change um, and this regime where the coherences have reached steady state. That's the standard picture of what we call great equations. They're kind of cl classical-ish in the sense that we don't think about the superposition of ground and excited. We just say, what's the probability or what's the fraction of the excited state? What's the fraction of the ground state? And how does that population change as a function of time? In like population equations for rabbits and, and foxes. Okay? There, that's what people often call the master equation kind of thing in, in non-equilibrium classical statistical physics. You think about some probability distributions at an equilibrium, and there's some master equation tells you how it. That's where the term master equation came from in quantum mechanics, why it's called the master equation. It's not a master of anything. It's just, it's a, it was termed borrowed from classical non-equilibrium statistical physics. Okay, when you're thinking about populations. Well, of course, in quantum, it also is not about the populations, it's about the coherences as well as the populations and the couplings we want to know. So the equations we got for those for are have this form where there's stimulated emission as well as spontaneous emission and absorption, which has the same rate per, uh, you know, given a certain equal amount of population. And in steady state, what we find is that the population in the excited state uh, goes to this value. And it's an important parameter here that characterizes uh, the strength of the excitation is what's called the saturation parameter. Okay? It's how much we can saturate or equate the uh, amount of excited state and ground state population. So for very, very small s, when s is small compared to 1, then the population of the excited state is proportional to s. And s given it in this expression, is proportional to the intensity, okay? So the more intensity, the more I have, except ultimately it saturates. So it goes up linearly for small s, and then it saturates. It saturates to the value one half, okay? That's why it's called the saturation parameter. Um, and we can characterize that by property, so this is the applied intensity, the saturation parameter depends on the applied intensity of the field. And it's characterized by some characteristic in intensity that's a product, that's a property of the atom in the transition that I'm driving, okay? Um, and that saturation intensity can be written as, you know, as intensity is a energy per unit area per unit time, right? So the energy is photon energy divided by the area, which is the 
uh, absorption cross section area on resonance, and the time is uh, one half uh, uh, or one over two times the lifetime of the atom. Okay. So on resonance, the saturation parameter is the intensity over the saturation. <clears throat> All right. Um, so now, as I discussed at the very end of lecture last time. Um, so the two-level atom uh, has some interest, um, but it's rare often, I mean, it's not typically the case that it's a way that we can really control quantum coherence, which is what the name of the game is here, between the ground excited states, because typically, unless we have something special, we'll talk about case in a moment, that excited state is not very long lived, in which case it will decay rapidly and we'll lose the coherence. So if we want to manipulate coherence, um, quite often we can't do that directly with some electric dipole transition. Okay? We'll, look, we'll talk about a demo where we can, but quite often we cannot. For example, so let's suppose I'm, I have the following situation, consider the following situation. Let's say I look at the ground electronic sublevels of an alkaline atom. Okay. So if we think about that, um, the, we're in the ground state, it's like hydrogen, right? The ground state is an S state, L equals zero. So let's talk about an atom I know well, cesium, use it all the time in these quantum experiments. And cesium uh, has, the group, its ground state <coughs> has principal quantum number six, and it's an L equals zero state, so it's an S state. So we would call it a 6S, okay? It's got one electron in the, in the uh, valence cell, so it's, it's a spin one half, so we call it a 6S one half. It's the total angle momentum, electron angle momentum. J is a half. It also has a nuclear spin. The nuclear spin is seven halves for the one that's not radioactive. Um, and, uh, you know, when you go to an isotopes game, do you ever ask anyone around you if they know what an isotope is? <laughs> I do. I've never met anyone who does. <laughs> uh, um, anyway, uh, so that means that the total angular momentum, angular momentum could be what? Three or four. Three or four, right? Because I can add the total angular momentum which is I plus F, so my, I can have an F equals 4 or an F equals 3. And that means the total number, each one of these has two F plus 1 sublevels. There are nine magnetic sublevels here and seven sublevels here. Okay, so the, the spectrum would look like with the M sub X right? And they're split 
by a hyperfine splitting. Which in cesium is 9.2 gigahertz times Planck's constant. Okay, H nu. Um, all right, so suppose I want to say, call this my two level atom. These two particular levels, and I want to. Do Bobby, this would be a nice way of manipulating coherence because the lifetime of this is essentially infinite. I mean, it's never going to spontaneously decay down here for two reasons. Which, one is that the frequency is so low, and you remember that the spontaneous emission rate depends on the cube of the frequency. So that, forget it. And on top of that, the matrix element that couples them is not very big. So if you would calculate the lifetime of that, it's infinity, basically. Okay? It's not going to spontaneously decay over any time scale of interest. I don't even know what the lifetime is. I don't know how it compares to the lifetime of the universe, but it's fine. Um, all right. So that sounds good. There's no worry about spontaneous emission, so it looks like but can I drive this transition on an electric dipole transition? No. Why not? Because the poles are zero. Right. I can't go from L equals zero to L equals zero uh, or from F. From, I, I have to change parity on electric dipole transition. This is a magnetic dipole transition. Okay? So I could apply a microwave that was oscillating at this frequency. And the magnetic field part of that wave would drive this transition. Instead of a d.e, dot it would be a u.d. Dot And there were off-diagonal matrix elements of the magnetic dipole operator. And that would be fine, but it would be as, you know, I can't, it's only so much microwave power I can get. It's as much smaller, the magnetic dipole moment is much smaller than the electric dipole moment. And it's not going to be, I can't generate very fast control that way. Unless I want to fry my graduate students with high, you know, you know, high uh, amplified microwaves floating around the lab. That would be pretty nasty, right, Andy? We don't know how to do that. So, um, so what are we going to do? We really would like to be able to control this optically. In addition, we might want to look at a very particular atom. A microwave has a very long wavelength, and I can't focus it down to one atom and just manipulate that one atom. Whereas a laser beam, I can focus and get it to talk to some particular atom that's within that focus. Um, so what one does in that situation is instead of thinking about direct connection on a one microwave photon based on a magnetic dipole, one says, well, up here there's the excited states, like, you know, the 6p. And there's one of these sublevels up here, say, that uh, might be, oh, it doesn't matter which one. Let's say it's the one with, there's a 6p, 1 half with f equals 4, and this is m sub f equals 4 as well. So some level up there, excited. I could drive the system up here and back here with two laser fields. That the difference between them is 9.2 gigahertz. Okay. 
Then there is a two photon transition corresponding to absorption and stimulated emission between these two. Okay. Now, I'm really interested in controlling the coherence here. I don't, I mean, the whole point of this was this guy, of course, will decay pretty quickly. So I don't really want to involve it in the dynamics. Otherwise, I will lose coherence. So the idea here is to detune far enough, as we'll see, from the excited state resonance so that this excited state doesn't participate very much in the dynamics of what's going on. And eventually, what I get down to is an effective two-level system that's driven by an effective Rabi frequency associated with those two lasers. Okay? So this is an example of what we call a three-level atom. And there are kind of three categories of that that we, we talk about often in different contexts. We have what we call the lambda configuration. And that's where I imagine I have three levels. We typically call them one, two, and three because we're very creative. And it's called the lambda configuration because the configuration of laser beams looks like a lambda. Uh, and we have this where this is detuned in some amount, and it could be on two photon resonance or a little bit off. So there's some of this one and this lambda, this little bit of that. Okay. Another configuration you can imagine where this is going to come from is the V configuration. In the V configuration, what we imagine is we have two levels that are up here and then some intermediate level down here. So this is one, this is two, and this is three. <clears throat> For whatever reason, we care about this. That's the V configuration for those three levels. And then the third configuration we have is where the intermediate state is in between the two levels that we're controlling. So I might have what's called the ladder configuration. And in the ladder configuration, we have a situation that looks like this. One, two, and three is in the middle there. And we have something that might look like this. delta without it jumping right into the big delta? So there are two colors here. And I'm defining, for example, here, this is big delta. Big delta is the difference between uh, the laser frequency 1 and Three, one. Now, you're right that there's also another detune because, I mean, this guy is there and it could drive this. And that has to be thought about. 
in a typical situation, typically, but not always, this guy is close enough to this that we consider this to be near resonance with some delta off, but near enough. Like this might be, say, one gigahertz off resonance, or this might be a terahertz off resonance. Just ignore this one relative to this because it's so far off resonance from that 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 doesn't matter. So for let me give you an example of that that I probably should have drawn differently. So let me draw that differently so that it, it looks more like it. Um, so let's say, let's go back to season. Let's say that this guy was the ground state. And this guy is the first excited state. And this guy is a state that is damn close and darn close to um, ionization. It's at 100S. Okay? It's at a huge principal quantum number. The space in between them, this is what we would call a Richard state. Um, you remember how it really bunches up? I mean, if you think about the spectrum, I mean, when you get close to ionization, it's really bunched up up there. So this might be, you know, an, an optical photon, and this a uh, very far infrared. This might be a one micron and this a half a micron type of, uh, type of thing. Um, now, why would I want to do that? Well, I can't get from here to here directly in a one photon transition. It's not dipole allowed. But I can get there in a two photon transition. And in fact, there's a lot of work, I'm working on it myself right now, on using these very large principal quantum number atoms as a vehicle for doing quantum manipulations because once you're in such a high principal quantum number, the atom, the electron is so far from the nucleus that it's, it's, very, it's very polarizable. And it's very easy for it, it to get to talk to another nearby atom where they will become quantum entangled or quantum they will become quantum interacting. So being able to put, and these levels are very long lived, as opposed to the, this guy will decay in, you know, I don't know, what is it, the light, it's five megahertz with some, some, some number of nanoseconds, it'll decay, whereas this guy, you know, will stay up there for, you know, 100 microseconds, which is a, basically forever in atomic physics line. Um, so, uh, so that this as an effective two-level system is a very nice way of controlling quantum coherence. Okay, so how do we treat such a system? Well, I mean, we have the Schrodinger equation, and uh, so we can write it down. We can see how the system evolves when we we drive it. Um, okay. Now one of the things we see in this kind of situation is that when the detuning to the intermediate state There's a, there's a Rabi frequency, 
right? The Rabi frequency, remember, is the strength of the electric field times the dipole matrix element that connects those two levels, right? So this would be equal to minus d uh, three one dotted into the electric field of later one. <coughs> Etc. So when this is true, what I claim is that the population in three is small. How do we see that? Assuming it starts in one. Well, you, we could think about it in terms of the saturation parameter. The saturation parameter, you remember, depending on the square of the Rabi frequency divided by the detuning square. Right? That tells me, in some sense, how big, how much I get into the excited state. Another way to think of it, I could also think about it from the point of view of time-dependent perturbation theory. We've studied that. In terms of what is the probability amplitude, it's going to depend on the matrix element of the interaction divided by the resonance denominators, which is, again, the ratio of the interaction matrix element is the Rabi frequency divided by the detuning. So in that case, what we, what I, we want to sh show is that we can say that very, during the dynamics, very little of the population ever really gets into three. And moreover, the dynamics of three is slaved to the dynamics of what's going on in one and two. It's after a very short time, three effectively reaches its steady state and is driven to whatever one and two are doing. That is to say, what happens in three adiabatically follows dynamics in three adiabatically follows one and two. And that leads us to what we call adiabatic elimination, which we're going to discuss now. How we can eliminate this intermediate level so that effectively we get it back to a two-level system. And what three is doing is kind of irrelevant. It's just a function of what one and two are doing. We just have to follow one and two and we don't have to follow three. There's yet another thing we could say about this. We want to we could loosely say when we're sufficiently far detuned to from level three, the intermediate level, then we're not making real transitions into three. We're only making virtual transitions into three. Hold up for one minute. So that's a language we use. It's a slippery language, in my view. I mean, I'm not sure exactly what it means. We got the Schrodinger equation, and it just it does the Schrodinger equation. If I want to think that there's some notion of it is really in here, or it's really in here, or it's really in here, and then sometimes it's only virtually in there, I, I don't know what that really means, but that's a language that people like to use. It's not a real transition, it's a virtual transition. So let's see what the math tells us, and then we can think about how to interpret that. Okay. So why do we even bother doing it through three? Because it seems like there should be, or like is that irrelevant in the sense that if we wanted to, it seems like it would be very difficult to get it from 6s to 100s. Um, but like, 
why do we want to go through three? Why do we have to worry about it? Uh, well, there is no way to get directly from one to two. Okay. From six S two S because this is not an allowed transition. Oh, okay. okay. Yes, sir. Back. Uh, we did a different kind of transition than that. Oh, yeah. uh, we could in certain cases. So, I mean, in this case, this is just not allowed because it's an S to S, and that's just not. But say this was six P to hundred P, that's fine. I could do that, but again, that. <coughs> It's like the same problem that we had. There's always these trade-offs. This is an electric quadrupole transition in this case, right? And that's such a weak transition. We would need so much intensity. I mean, it would be weak for so many reasons. One is that it's an S to D transition. But the overlap of the radial wave function from Six to hundred is already so small. This you would need, you know, probably the kind of lasers they use to try to do nuclear fusion to drive this with enough megahertz. So as we will see, the effective Robbie frequency that we get through the two photon via the intermediate virtual transition gives us a much stronger transition rate. Yeah. Uh, this, will, this will probably come out in the math, but what if we make delta large enough that that third level doesn't, it doesn't really come into play? Um, we do need to make it large enough that the spontaneous emission from three is negligible. Uh, so it's, I think it will come out in the math. How big is too big and what do we need to do? What is it big compared to what? Uh, big compared to omega L. Right. Omega so if it's huge compared to both of the Rabi frequencies, what you will see is that the effective Rabi frequency, the effective two photon Rabi frequency, will be tiny. Okay. So we'll see what these trade-offs are in a moment. Let's look at the math. So to get to this notion of adiabatic elimination, let me first talk about something easier. Let's go back to our friend, the two-level atom. Okay. And let's look at a case where I'm in the ground, say so it's the excited state, and I'm pretty far detuned from resonance compared to the Robbie frequency. Okay? I claim I'll get to, I can eliminate the excited state and get a one level out. Let's see how that works. So, let's write down the dynamics of this. So, we can literally say, well, we have the effective Hamiltonian here, which in the rotating frame, in the rotating wave approximation, we have uh, all right, so we have the imaginary part of the excited state having to do with the decay. And then we have the off-diagonal coupling that couples around the excited states, right? That's our effective two level atom with the, with the non commission Hamiltonian. So we have our equation of motion here says that the excited state uh, Evolves I mean, by the Schrodinger equation. So that's uh, I times delta plus I gamma over 2 to the excited state. That's for this thing minus I omega over 2 CG. And CG dot is minus I omega over 2 CG. So that's just. 
the time-dependent Schroeder equation based on this modernization Hamiltonian. Now, let's take a look at this equation and this equation. We see there's different dynamical time scales here in this differential equation. This guy is, in the absence of this, is evolving according to the time scales associated with the tuning and gamma, right? Whereas the ground state is evolving according to which the way the ground state changes is a uh, time scale that's related to the Rabi frequency. So we want to consider a case where this is a fast time scale, or at least delta. So we want to consider the case where this is huge compared to that. Okay? That's what we want to look at back here. It could be right on resonance, in which case it would be that the Rabi frequency is small compared to the spontaneous emission rate. Or, more interestingly for us, the case where we're very far off resonance and the detuning is the thing that is big compared to the Rabi frequency. Okay, but either, it's really the magnitude that matters. Okay? This is another way of saying that this squared over this squared plus this squared is much, much less than 1, which is to say the saturation parameter is much, much less than 1. All right, so let's take this equation and let's just formally integrated. Okay? Let's look at a formal solution to this equation. What I mean by a formal solution is it's not the actual solution because it'll be implicit, but it's a formal solution. You know how to solve a differential equation like that? Right in the matrix form on the eye values and the vectors. Uh yeah, you could do that. <laughs> uh, that'll work. You have to uh, you have to diagonalize all that. But if I just looked at this, if I have an equation of this form, what is the solution you missed uh, yeah. to that differential equation? Got some exponential in it, right? Plus an integral of g. Something like that, right? There's a Green's function, right? There's a Green's function for a differential equation, which is an exponential, right? Now everyone who yaps about having to take 466 and doesn't want to, that's why we do this, because you've got to go through these solutions. So this is going to be e minus at f of 0 plus an integral d to the minus a t minus d prime g of t prime. You should be able to just look at that and know that that's a solution. Okay? Um, d t prime. All right. So with that said, what is the solution, the formal solution to this equation? It has exactly this form, right? This is f of t and this is g of t, right? So that says that the excited state, the function of time, let's take that at time equal to zero to all in the ground state. So. Right? so let's take that as my initial condition. It's all in the ground state at the initial time. So then this is equal to e to the uh, i delta plus i gamma over 2 t integral dt e to the minus i delta plus 
die. Yeah, I'm going to be prime times. Okay. Is that a minus size of the exponent exponents back like flipped? Oh, okay. It seems like the one with the minus should be on the outside. No, because this is A. I'm calling this the thing on the outside of minus A. Oh, I see. Right. All right, so this is why I call it a formal solution because it still has this function in here. It's not, I don't actually know what the solution is because I have to solve this, but this depends on that and on and on and on and, on and can do the value of that. Yeah? This is just an integral equation? Just it's an integral equation. The differential equation to the integral mm -hmm. equation. That's what it is. Yeah. But now we can make an approximation, right? Now, the point here is that this thing, assuming, these, assuming the parameters are chosen such that this is true, then this is a very rapidly oscillating exponential compared to this, which is very slowly varying. Right? Which means I can, under that approximation, factor this out of the integral. So under the approximation that the rate at which this is effectively is a constant over the time scale that that is changing. Because it's changing so, so slowly compared to this rapid, rapid oscillation. So under the approximation that this is tiny compared to this, then we can take this outside the integral approximately. tells me that this solution then is equal to one let's see so this becomes equal to the minus i delta gamma over two t minus one over minus i delta plus gamma over two Bring it all together, I get that this is equal to 1 minus e to the i delta minus gamma over 2 t over minus i gamma plus delta over 2 c g. Why do you evaluate c g at t as opposed to any other time? Slowly, could we do it at zero also? Just one. Well, we want to keep track of dynamics of the uh, of c of everything over the time scale over which c g changes. So if if we just kept it fixed, then nothing would happen whatsoever. You know, this is a bit of a hand-waving solution. Certainly, we could do this much more formally as an integral differential equation using what's known as the method of averages. Okay? I mean, what we see here is as a differential equation, you know, we have terms here with rapidly varying time-dependent coefficients. And when you have a differential equation with coefficients that are constant and coefficients that are rapidly varying in time, 
if the coefficients are small compared to the time scale in which those rapid changes happen, if you do a formal solution to that as a power series expansion, you will always find that those rapidly varying terms contribute little to the equation. Right? And that's what's happening here. Over in time scale, this is big enough. This rapidly varying term is negligible. And what we end up with is the following. We end up with an equation that says we can adiabatically eliminate and say that CGT is approximately equal to 1 over minus I plus gamma over 2. This is the adiabatic elimination. We have eliminated what's going on in the excited state in favor of what's going on in the ground state. Another way of looking at it, if I go back to this equation, this equation is nothing more than just setting the time derivative of this to zero. And saying after it's effectively, in the short time scale, the dynamics, the transient dynamics of the excited state reach steady state. And they can't, they want to go faster, but they can't because they're being slaved to this sluggish CG, which moves much more slowly than this. All right, and so I just set this derivative to zero and just eliminate it. And that's the easiest way to do adiabatic elimination. You just set the time derivative to zero. All right, so now with that said, I have a one level atom. G. And the ground state has some dynamics. The time derivative, if I can plug this back in, is equal to minus i omega. So that becomes minus omega squared over 2 times minus i delta plus gamma over 2. CK. Plugging it back in. Right? There's a four over four. Okay? So let's look at that equation. This tells me that this is equal to. Um, minus i omega squared over 4 delta squared plus gamma squared over 4 times delta cg minus omega squared over 4 delta squared minus gamma squared over 4 gamma Over. 
So, this has the following form. We recognize there's a saturation parameter in there. This is CG dot is equal to uh, minus I S over two delta C G minus one half S over two gamma. Said is the saturation parameter. S is gamma and the omega squared over 2, delta squared plus gamma squared over 4. This has the following form. This is minus E, which I'm going to some, some energy I'm going to call delta E light shift minus gamma S over 2. or minus i over 2 over h bar delta del s minus i gamma s over 2 g. Where this energy, I'm calling the light shift energy, is h bar delta times s over 2. And the gamma of s is s over 2. So how should we think about what is the physical meaning of this equation? Notice the relationship between this equation, the form of this equation, and the form of this equation. which was the excited state. We have some deltas and uh, gammas here. Uh, yeah. Are we missing an H bar somewhere? Uh, yeah, no, they should be that. Sorry, I'm just going to pass and lose some H bars. So what is this equation? What we see here is that once we've adiabatically eliminated the excited state, we have a dynamic of the ground state. That dynamic of the ground state has two parts to it. A part that is like a real part and a part that's like an imaginary part, right? This represents an additional phase that is being accumulated on the probability amplitude, which is equivalent to saying that there's an energy level shift. There's an energy level shift on the ground state that is due to a being perturbed by the application of the light. It is shifted by the light. That is called a light shift. So the energy of the ground state is being shifted in energy. And that shift in energy depends on the intensity of the light. It's proportional to the intensity of the light. So it also depends on the detuning of the light. So this is what we call the light shift. Okay. What about this? This is saying that there is some rate at which decay happens relative to the ground states. That rate is the spontaneous emission rate times S over 2. But well, what was S over 2? That was the population in the excited state. So the rate at which things decay out of the ground state is first it has to get to the excited state, and then it spontaneously decays. That's gamma sub s, which is called the photon scattering rate. So there's a rate at which photons 
I send in light and they're scattered from this due to the fact that I absorb and then emit. And there's some pop that's excited. This is what's known as the photon scattering. So it would it would generally be so there's two things you shouldn't confuse. One is the light shift and one is the scattering. They're two different things. The light shift is a coherent effect. It's saying that because of the fact that I'm inducing a typo moment and that induced typo moment interact with the field gives me an energy shift. Okay? In addition though, this thing could scatter, and it could scatter into a different level altogether. It absorbs and then scatters into some other level. Right? That means that the population in the, in the ground state will just decay. And the reason it decays is that first it gets absorbed and then it, gets, it, it emits. Remember, in our effective Schrodinger picture, we don't include here the refeeding of population. It's not included in how the population gets back. So you have to do a, a different treatment in that case. Yeah. You drew the light shift and it's going down. Yeah. How do we know? We don't. We don't. So let's look at that. So let's look at that. And the way, so now what I claim is that light shift is nothing more than the perturbation on the energy levels of the atom due to the interaction with the light. So when we think about the interaction with the light, usually we think the light causes just absorption, right? It takes population from the ground, it's excited. But it does more than that. It shifts the energy levels. The energy levels of the atoms are shifted due to their interaction with the light. Okay? So that means what we want to do, let's I mean, we could keep an imaginary part around for that, but let's just look at the true Hamiltonian without the imaginary part. And let's just look at, so this is the Hamiltonian for the atom plus light in the rotating frame. What, what operator is this? Uh, yeah, that was E. states of this Hamiltonian are the perturbed energy levels.
All right. So, bare levels. No interaction with light. So that means the Rabi frequency is set to zero. That's right. Now we can still look at the bare levels in the rotating frame because it's useful to do so, to see how they transform as I turn the laser off. My Hamiltonian was this in the rotating frame, which is equal to, in the two-level situation that's like spin up, that's one plus sigma z over two. Hamiltonian, it depends on the sign, what, what, we, what is the lower energy level and what is the higher energy level depends on the sign of the detuning, right? <coughs> so let's first take the detuning to be uh, <coughs> less than zero. This is red detuning. In this case, that means that this is a positive number. And in the excited state, it's here. And the ground state is here. Right? This is P equals 0. And this is P equals that. Right? For blue detunium, it's the other way around. Here's e equals zero. And this is lower in energy. Now, what, what the heck am I talking about? The excited state is lower energy than the ground state. Remember what we've done here is that we've subtracted the equivalent energy of one photon, right? That's what we did when we went to the rotating frame. This is the h bar omega that minus that, okay? So the question is which is, or the laser? The, equation, the question is which one's bigger? The energy of the photon or the energy of the atom? If the energy of the atom is bigger than the energy of the photon, I'm red D2. And then this is the higher energy level. If the energy of the photon is bigger than the energy of the atom, when I'm in the excited state, then I'm blue D2. And then the excited state has less energy because I subtracted that off. Okay? All right. That's the bare levels. Now let's talk about the dress levels. Or minus h bar negative 
to the square root of omega squared plus delta squared. All right, how do we see that? Well, this is h bar omega to dot sigma. Our omega tote is omega in the x direction minus delta in the z direction. And the eigenvalues are the magnitude of omega tote plus or minus that over 2. The eigenvalues of this are plus or minus 1. So we can diagonalize the 2 by 2 matrix by doing that. And what are the eigenvalues? Well, have spin up along the direction of megatope and spin down along the direction of megatope. And that is equal to, as we remember, there's a mixing angle here, cosine theta over 2 uh, spin up, which is the excited state, plus sine theta over 2 spin down. And this to cos theta minus cos theta d plus sine no g. Yes, minus minus. Where theta is the direction of this in the xy plane, right? So tangent of theta is. the x component over the z component. So this is what we talked about earlier in the semester, how to find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of a two-level system. Notice the dress states are superpositions of ground excited because they're dressed by the laser. They have an induced dipole moment. That induced dipole moment interacts with the electric field and gives me an energy level shift. And that energy level shift is this. So if I just to complete our picture here, this splitting here is the magnitude of the detuning in the absence of the interaction. Now I turn on the interaction, and these things now get shifted. And they get shifted by an amount. So now this splitting is the square root of omega squared plus delta squared. Notice now that this shift is down. So what was the ground state is shifted to a lower energy. If I'm red d2, what about this case? Well, again, the same thing goes up. This guy goes down. This is the splitting this in the absence of the interaction that with the interaction it's this. Now the ground state is shifted up if I'm blue detuned. So we'll talk about this some more. I should say this is how if I have a suppose I have a laser beam and the laser beam has a profile of intensity as a function of the transverse direction. That's a Gaussian. It's got a peak of intensity. This means at higher intensities, and let's suppose the tuning is red. At higher intensities, the energy is shifted more. I, I make a potential well for trapping an atom at the strong part of the laser beam. That's what we call an optical tweezer. On the other hand, I can make a blue bottle and repel the atom so that it, its energy goes up if it moves into the light. So once it gets repelled, it would move away from regions of high intensity because its energy goes up. That's blue D2. Okay? And that's how optical forces work. All right, to be continued. Um, everyone will be happy to know that problem three on the current problem set will be postponed.
for one month is very not safe.